Okay, hold on. Now, let's talk about how this really went down. I went from refashioning fashion to have fashion refashion me. I was born and raised in the poorest section of Harlem. My first experiences was with crime. I became a professional gambler, and to be a professional gambler, you have to be a professional con man. I knew that I had to dress nice and keep a pocket full of money, but I didn't want to be part of that life anymore, so I decided that I wanted to open up a store because I like luxury clothes, I like expensive stuff, silks, alligators, and crocodiles, and furs, and cater to the people who I knew in the community, the hustle element, the criminal element, and sell those type of things. And that's how I started my first store, Dapper Dance. I started out like with a small store, 500 square feet. And I said, you know what, since I'm gonna be catering to hustlers, I'll make my store so it could be open 24 hours. There was nobody selling furs in Harlem but me. So right away I started getting a lot of attention. And then I knew all the major gangsters. Jack Jackson was the biggest drug dealer to come along in Harlem after Nicky Barnes. One day he came in the store and he had a Louis Vuitton pouch. And everybody was fascinated with the pouch. And I looked at that pouch and I said to myself, what is it about that pouch? I know that ain't nothing but $10 worth of vinyl. And I looked at it, I said, you know what it is? It's the symbols. So I said, you know what? If I can make garments out of those symbols, I can have a huge impact. So after I taught myself textile printing, that opened up a whole new window for me. What I did was I would make reversible fur coats. One side would be fur and the other side might be Louis Vuitton or Gucci or Fendi. And that's when it just mushroomed into an even bigger than what I was in the beginning. With a cheek on my chest, I don't need that with ten. I'm going to tell you the name of this man. He gave us by the name of the Dapper Dan. Hey, yo, you can ask Dapper Dan who was the man back in 88. There has been a lot of rap lyrics written about me. But when hip-hop started, right, rappers didn't have any money. So all the rappers that used to come by the store, they couldn't afford to even buy what I had. The rappers like to be around the gangsters and like to look like the gangsters and dress like the gangsters. So eventually, as the rap music started to take off, the rappers started to make more money than the gangsters because all the gangsters was going to jail as rap music was exploding. LL Cool J, Boogie Down Production, Big Daddy Kane, Slick Rick. Outside of New York, everybody wants to be like New York. Inside of New York, Everybody wants to be like Harlem. Harlem had that magic. So goes Harlem, so goes the whole black culture world. It started there, you know? Diane Dixon was an Olympic track star who had won gold medals, and she used to come to the store all the time. But she was different. She was way ahead of her time with what she wanted. And she had this idea. She said, Dap, I want you to make me something really special. I said, okay, what you want to look like? She said, I just want it to look high fashion, right? So we came up with this concept that she would have these balloon sleeves. So I went and got that material and I blew the arms up and I used mahogany fur. And then I used a butter soft Louis Vuitton and then put the material out to give it that effect. And it worked out amazing. So when Diane bust out with that, they didn't know how to take it at first. And then everybody started saying, wow, 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 because it was a lot, you know what I mean? I could not even imagine that the look that Diane Dixon wore would have such an impact on my life 30 years later. Check it out, cuz. Yo, MTV Rap, Saturday at 10 a.m. at 10 p.m. Eastern. Yo, MTV Rap was building, and they were seeing these garments that I was making. This week on Yo, MTV Rap, you travel to Dapper Dan's All Night Boutique. And so the brand started, I said, who the hell is a Dapper Dan? They started putting everything together and finding out where this was coming from, and that's when the raid started. MCM, Fendi, and Louis Vuitton. Gucci never raided me. It was those three, basically. They would come in with a cease and desist order, meaning that they could take any garments that they saw that had their logos on it. And I was losing a lot of money. They kept raiding me, raiding me, raiding me. But I would keep building right back up. And one day, Fendi came to raid me. Sotomayor, Sonia Sotomayor, one of the Chief Justices of the Supreme Court. At the time, she was working for Fendi. And she came on a raid. I had a coat in there that I had just finished and it was for Big Daddy Kane. She looked at that coat and said, wow, this guy belongs downtown. She paid me a compliment and then raided the store and took everything. All of a sudden, everything came to an end. I refused to give up. 
I regrouped myself, found me an underground place where I could continue to make clothes, and start it all over again. I would pack everything up in my car and hit all the major black cities from New York all the way across to Chicago, and then come back, reload, and then go all the way down to Atlanta. And that's how I sustained myself for 20 years underground. I was the best kept secret. I think being born broke and poor was a great asset for me because starting all over didn't bother me. I was prepared for the battle. In 2017, life changed for me. All of a sudden, one of my creations popped up on the Gucci runway. It was the same Diane Dixon look that I had did 30 years earlier. I was used to white folks taking stuff from us. That was a given, you know? But the new generation said, no, man, they wasn't having it. You know, internet, social media gave people a color of voice. So when people saw that coat that Gucci made, it was an uproar. Next thing I know, my son told me, they want to get in touch with you. They want to be in the partnership. So I told my son, I said, if they serious, I said, tell them to come to Harlem. And they came. Black people say, man, don't do nothing with Gucci. Don't partner with Gucci. I grew up in the 60s. What I've learned watching the civil rights movement of the 60s, that the most important thing that a person of color can do is to get inside, to have a seat at the table. That is the most important reason for me taking that deal. The Gucci deal involved that they would set me up, make it possible for me to work the same way I worked when I initially started out 30 years ago. But the only difference this time, I would be working with only Gucci fabrication. We would do a joint project together, a joint collection together, and that would go global. It was the ideal situation. It made all the sense in the world to me. Gucci allowed for me to break the Jim Crow barriers in fashion. So now my real freedom is coming. This is gonna be the biggest stage of my life. My plans is to try to work with young designers and show them how everything I did was connected to the culture and how to translate culture. Because that's the key to what I do, translate culture make it possible for our culture to continue to have the significant impact on global fashion it has now. On the dollar bill, you see e pluribus unum, and you see what's happening now. America has the ability to bring us all together, so I want my legacy to be that I did something to make that happen. <laughs>